to another great edition of the Ground Sport Interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown, as always, and I am pleased to have our returning guest to the show. He was here during the municipal campaign, but he's back doing a little bit bigger aspirations when it comes to politics. That is Take Back Alberta. We have the CEO of Take Back Alberta, Zane Novak. Zane, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. Oh, Christopher, it is so, it's my honor to be invited back again. Yes. Uh, we love doing the interview. I was sitting here with my team back when I was running for mayor. Uh, was that like September, I think we did? I think it was September. September of 2021. Yeah. Uh, what an adventure, and now here I am in a slightly different role, but still with similar uh, goals for my community yep. and our province. So thanks for having me back. Hey, I'm always, always, always. So take back Alberta. It seems like a very loaded question, but let's start off with the easy one. Who are we taking it back from? Well, I think that what our goal is, well, I know what our goal is. Our goal is to take back ownership of our province as citizens and to reverse the tide. <clears throat> For so long, we have had what we thought were elected representatives of the populace. But, you know, it's really become, they become our overlords and our taskmasters. So it's taking back, um, I would say, government to a certain degree without an open <laughs> revolt or revolution or anything crazy like that. But just taking it back and the method that we're doing it through is by encouraging people to get engaged, get involved in politics and taking it back that way. So where did this idea come from? Because uh, I've been following the story about Take Back Alberta. I saw your interview, I think it was either with Don or Rick from uh, Calgary Herald or Calgary Sun, um, where you were upset of how politics is being done in this province provincially and you were talking about bringing a hopefully a more engaging type of politics to pol uh, to provincial politics so where did that idea come from because you saw the municipal campaign up close and personal you saw the engagement people weren't engaged in this last municipal campaign is that where you're taking it from and putting it onto a provincial scale so what I learned running for mayor uh, was a lot of things. Number one, it was hard to get, like you just mentioned, it was very hard to get people engaged. We see that during the municipal election, there was a pretty low, like 36 or 40% turnout of all eligible voters even bothered to show up and vote. <clears throat> and it was disheartening, discouraging. But through that journey, my platform, though not a platform of austerity, was fiscally responsible and I believe well written and a lot of my engagement resonated with people who wanted less taxes, less overreach, less oversight, less regulation, more autonomy, more ability for choice of our futures, our futures of our children and of our community. So after the election I continued to have tons and tons of groups and individuals reaching out to me saying oh we want you to be our advocate, we want you to be on our board, etc, etc. But I would say, though I was nonpartisan in running for mayor, I didn't have any political cards. I, I'm obviously more conservative in my leaning and my fiscal responsibility. So it resonated with a lot of people who traditionally be, you know, put in that right category as conservatives. Yeah. But it was really hard to pick a group or a political party to get involved in because there are so many. <laughs> and you know, you can look at a group. You can go into things like Telegram, which I don't have anymore. And you know, you can find like. 50 to 60 just in Calgary kind of that right-leaning groups well how do you pick one this one's got 10 members that one's got 100 members this one's got a thousand this one's got five they all have some good mandates and I realized that you know on the conservative side of things it isn't that anybody needs to beat us we beat ourselves because we never get united we never work together and so I found that discouraging and so I didn't join any I took some time off to the off after the mayoral election and then myself and a couple other guys, you know, we've had a lot of concerns with how the provincial government is being led, specifically by the Premier. Yeah. His engagements, not only at a provincial level, but even within his own caucus. My journey into politics <clears throat> over the last four, five years uh, has been intense on both the municipal and the provincial platform. Because uh, I think in my last podcast, I might have mentioned the fact that myself and a couple other guys with a team had come up with a plan to solve the orphan well, abandoned well, suspended well issue in this province, which 
is catastrophic and huge yeah. and only getting larger. Well, that journey took us to the legislative building countless times and engagement countlessly with um, all caucus members. And we tried to get past the premier into the premier to convince him, and we just couldn't get anywhere. And so that has been a very revealing journey to me, and I have some serious concerns about the way Jason Kenney leads the province and the party. It's not collaborative. It's not engaging. I know many fantastic MLAs. I know some I don't think are as fantastic, but he's not engaging and in, in, in working with the team. So what happened is there's this leadership review that was supposed to be an in-person ballot on April 9th in Red Deer. By, I think if I'm not mistaken, by official party guidelines and rules, it was supposed to be yeah, in-person, correct? Yeah, definitely <laughs> following the book, it was supposed to be. It was announced February 9th, and that meant it was written in stone to happen April 9th. And that, what that was is very unique. It was just such a unique opportunity. It really resonated with me because that allowed card-carrying party members, $10 mm -hmm. a year to be a member, a $10 card-carrying member to go to Red Deer and in-person place your vote if, you're con if you had confidence in the leader of the party or not. And that's democracy. That's awesome. That's amazing. And I thought, you know, this is something that can unite conservatives. Whether you support them or not, get involved, get engaged. Because what I've learned through this journey, Canada has some of the lowest civic engagement of any democratic or state again democratic country in the world. Only between 1 and 1.3% of eligible voters in Canada carry a political card, either provincially or federally, for any party. I mean, you can go to the states, and sometimes up to 60% of eligible voters They'll vote just in the primaries, mm -hmm. or they're just picking the person that's going to run. And here in Canada, it's just apathy, apathy, apathy. And of that 1%, only about 15% of that 1% would actually knock on a door, volunteer, donate, or vote in a nomination process. And, you know, everybody says we're controlled, we're controlled, we're controlled. Well, it's pretty easy to control 0.15% of the population that then controls the rest of the population. It's like that old saying, Christopher, that they always say, those who show up rule the world. Yep. So engaging in this leadership review uh, on April 9th allowed conservatives to focus on one issue. Yep. Get united, get together, get motivated, get off their couches, get out of wherever, and get to Red Deer and exercise your democratic right. So that resonated with me because I loved how it could unite uh, conservative type people on one cause and if you can solve that cause then you can start to move on to all the other things that fractionate us so much you know whether it's things like gun ownership less taxes support for business uh, mental health support of our youth our children engagement and all of those things the freedom from mandates the freedom to make choices about our medical records and how they're issued I mean fluoride in the water all these things seem to afflict the conservative right side of the ledger and fractionate us so I love the fact this was one topic Let's get on it. Let's get united, and let's let's win this battle. Well, and I, I love the fact that you stated that only a small percent choose nominees. I was at the Leslin Lewis event here in Calgary, down in the southeast, and her person who pitched the fundraising asked, who always is, there's always one in the political room, right? Who always says you should donate. He goes, you need to take out a membership because. There might be 35 million Canadians, but of those 35 million, 100,000 of those 35 million are card-carrying members of the Conservative Party. Of those 100,000, only 60,000 will actually vote. Of those 60,000, we need at least 30,000 to win, so we need to sign up 30,000 members. So even in parties, they know that the engagement's not there, and they only need a small amount of support, whether it be from this party or this section of the party to win. And before we talk about the leadership review, which we will hear in a few minutes, I want to stick on this whole engagement because I find it fascinating that you're going across the province, you're trying to engage with people. Are you finding people who haven't been engaged talking about being engaged and this would be the first time that they would be actively getting involved in a campaign or getting involved in a political movement like Take Back Alberta? 
Absolutely. And I think of all the things, that was one of the most encouraging. I have done literally hundreds and hundreds of these meetings. And the interesting thing, particularly in Calgary, uh, I spoke to two types of crowds. One was <clears throat> obviously the Polish and Romanian crowd. Because most of those individuals had literally fought their way out of a communist style regime. And they're, and I know some of your listeners might think this is dramatic, but I wish it, they could have participated in those meetings and talked to those individuals in their homes to listen to what they had experienced, what they got out of. They came to Canada for specific reasons, and it was to get away from what they see Canada going to now. A totalitarian type of rulership federally and provincially. And it terrifies them. Terrifies them. And I probably had 30 to 50 meetings and homes with 20 to 60 people in each one of those who came from particularly the Polish and the Romanian communities. But the other thing that really interested me and I found was just so exciting, all the other meetings that I had in Calgary, I, I kept track, started keeping track because it just shocked me. 66 to 75 percent, so two-thirds to three-quarters of the rooms were young professional mothers. I would say 28 to 40, early 40s, young children from newborns to early teens. And most of them had barely ever even voted before, let alone gotten involved in politics. And the other really interesting things uh, about those meetings were 98% of the question came from those, those moms. And they had their notebooks out, they had questions written down, they wrote down points that we made. They were so engaged. And it reminded me of that old saying, don't poke a mama bear, because they're protective. They are um, a whole force to be reckoned with. And that really encouraged me. Encouraged me, A, the age demographic, the fact it was moms, highly articulate, highly professional, highly, you know, sharp, sharp, sharp people and that they were showing an interest in this because they had firsthand felt the impact of the lockdowns, the pandemic, the restrictions, the face masking, the lack of socialization and the lack of relationship building and how it was impacting their children, their family and their family's household income also. And that was so encouraging to see all of that demographic just fired up and engaged and wanting to learn more. Why do you think people aren't engaged? Oh, why do people you know, get turned <laughs> off from politics? Because I can imagine you're crossing the province and talking to people, but you must be asking the simple question: What well, has stopped you? I think that it's a combination of things. You know, this goes back generationally. This isn't something that's just happened in the last twenty-six months. Okay, <laughs> for decades. Canada has been complacent about politics and there's a lady I know Daniel Smith and she writes a fairly well-researched newsletter every Sunday now when I was running for mayor I used to joke with and you know the couple of the individuals here Calvin and Dan were on my team <clears throat> and I get in like five or six in the morning and I had, it's the best time to write because there's no distraction put the coffee on and I'd write because it was writing answers it was writing platform writing policy and I always joked to my team I'm not running for mayor I'm running to be a writer <laughs> so Danielle Smith puts out a newsletter every Sunday to her network, and it's fairly free speech, nothing drugs or anything like that, but it's not through a me news media outlet that's censoring. It's just her newsletter to her yep. followers. And I respect it because it's well-researched. And about a month or so ago, she made some statements about where we are and, and how things work, and she took a snapshot of a thing called the Titler Cycle. And the Titler Cycle... It's like literally a circle, and it's got about a dozen words on it. It's kind of like that circle of life from Lion King, right? And so I'm just going to jump in at this, out of one out of word on this circle, and the word is abundance. And I think it's safe to say in Canada that for many, many years, we've had abundance, especially compared to the rest of the world. We, we're always one of the countries that are ranked in the highest standard, living, quality of life, cleanliness, health, education, on and on. We've had abundance. Well, the word that follows abundance is selfishness. Selfishness leads to complacency. Complacency to apathy. Apathy leads to dependence. And I think this is where, in the last 24, 26 months, the real catalyst, the fulcrum point has really tipped. 
with the pandemic, I think that the government weaponized it to a great degree, used it to their advantage, and created dependence. One of those things were, depending on the government for what it is, what we got to listen to the government. What is it safe to do? What is it safe not to do? Um, serve. Turn to the government for money. Turn to the government for support. And so once you rely so much on them and you get that dependency, the next word that falls is bondage. <clears throat> and you know, I, I look at they call it the Emergency Act, but it's really the War Measures Act that was enacted. Like, that's shocking. If you would have told anybody in this country three years ago that we would go into a War Measures Act without a war, without a gun being fired, without a gun even being confiscated, everybody would have said, you're a conspiracy theorist, you're insane, you're off your rocker. It happened. Yep. That bondage happened. And then what follows that? Well, a spiritual awakening of faith that then leads to courage, it gives you the ability to fight for liberty that then leads you back to abundance. I, I'm so happy you came on the show because I, I enjoy these type of conversations, the philosophy behind things. And I want to ask, because we are seeing the, the rise of the second wave of the Freedom Convoy. We are seeing Ottawa with, I, I'm not sure if it's called Freedom Convoy now, but there is a second version of it where... The motorbikes going, rolling thunder. Rolling thunder. Thank you so much, Zane, for correcting me on that. I would love to say that's great. I, I'm one of these people that's for free speech, say what you need to say and be proud. And if you have an issue, you should have the right to protest. I'm not saying anything against that. But show up at the ballot box as well. Yes. And this is the problem that I have. And this is why I'm so happy that you're on the show because I want to I want to have this a deep dive into this is how do we translate frustration to engagement? <laughs> So that's what we've really been trying to do with TBA. There we go. We actually, we're, we're, you know, we're nonpartisan, really. I mean, yeah. obviously, we, in this one, we're a very conservative movement because, A, we have a conservative government. Yeah. B, we have an opportunity to take care, take advantage of a democratic process, which is this leadership review, get people engaged, get them out there. What our goal is, is to get more and more people engaged, get them in whatever party they're in to carry a card. And you can carry a political card in every party. Yep. You're not limited to just one party. Even and though that the members, even though their rules say you shouldn't, I guarantee you right now the UCP is not contacting the NDP and saying, "Hey, is Chris Brown and Zane Novak part of the <laughs> UCP or the NDP?" Well, they're not. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> I actually had to buy a UCP party in February seventh because I didn't have cards when I was running for mayor because I was nonpartisan. I had to. I'm giving these lectures. Get involved. Get involved. I'm like, well, I should probably buy my own. I should card. do something here. <laughs> and because uh, I wanted to vote in that leadership race also in April. So what it is, is we want this to be an ongoing educational program, whether it's, you know, TBA or someone else. Help people understand how their constituency associations work, which are like a board of directors to the MLA. Yep. And there can be 10 to 30 people. There's presidents, there's vice presidents of policy, there's secretaries, treasurers, all of this. And they are two people like you and I, Chris. They're people in the community that are the voice of the community to the MLA that helped the MLA in his path at the ledge. And you'll hear things like a private member's bill. Well, that comes from constituency association presidents getting together and going, I think we should do this. Yeah. And they go to their MLAs who aren't in cabinet and they put forward a private member's bill. And it can be protective laws. It can be all kinds of different things. And that's coming really from truly the grassroots, no matter what party it is. So those are the type of things that we want to do. And we found that because of the pandemic, because of the frustration, because of the two-tiered system, the, the acceptable and the unacceptable, that a lot of people were really lit up about this and willing to finally listen and figure out how to get engaged. I don't think without this we would have got the engagement we did at all. I mean, when Jason Kenney was elected as Premier, there were about 155,000 paid active memberships in the UCP party. January 1st of 2022, there were somewhere between 12 and 15,000. And now, as of March 19th, which was the cutoff date to buy a membership before the April 9th vote, you have to be a card carrier for 21 days before you can vote on policy, there were 59,000 members. <clears throat> so we can see how in just like a couple of months, we took it from about 12,000 to 59,000. So do you get people engaged? That's what we really want. And we want to continue to have that involvement. So 
I don't know. What topic do you want to get on now? No, I, I do want to jump to the next topic, but before we do, I do have to take a commercial break, but we, we do have sponsors and we like to get paid. So we'll be right back after a brief message with Zane talking about Take Back Alberta, and we'll be going into the leadership review and where we go from here and what has caused the need for engagement on this type of level. So we'll be right back. June 2nd is Election Day in Ontario. Ontarians from Windsor to Ottawa, Toronto to Thunder Bay will be heading to the ballot box and electing their next provincial government. During the month of May, though, the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown will be in Ontario covering the election for our show with interviews with undecided voters, candidates for office, and political pundits across the spectrum. We have you covered for this biggest election of 2022. Now you can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite shows. Or, if you're like me, watch the show online via YouTube. So, we are back. Uh, we are back with Zane. Zane Novak, CEO of Take Back Alberta. Let's talk about that April 9th leader. April 9th? Yeah, April, April 9th. 9th. That seems so long ago. April 9th <laughs> leadership review that was supposed to happen at the special general meeting of the UCP in Red Deer. Um, the numbers came out. They said that they were going to have more than uh, they expected at that leadership review. So they pivoted and they went to a mail-in ballot. They will say, for those who are upset about the, the potential of... Uh, uh, what's the word I want to use here? Potential of actually not allowing all 59,000 members or however member, mem members there are of the UCP to vote on that one day. We need to open up to a mail-in ballot. This usurps democracy. In my opinion, democracy is you choose a date, that's when it is. You can't just say I'm going to call a provincial election for June 3rd. And then June 3rd comes around and say, well, actually, we're going to hold it on the 18th because we think we can do better on the 18th. When you're crossing the province, are you hearing the frustration from the conservative members saying that what happened from the April 9th to the May 18th change has gotten them more angry at the current UCP government when it comes to politics? Absolutely. Absolutely, Chris. It, um, and it resonates for a number of reasons. And there's a bit of a story to this. Um, number one, there are still two full investigations around Jason Kenney over the last leadership race. There is the investigation where there's six to 8,000 unknown to the individuals, memberships that were bought in the UCP name that then cast votes unknown to the owners of those IDs uh, in favor of Jason Kenney. That is still under RCMP investigation. <clears throat> so it's concerning. The second investigation, I think uh, it was actually CBC had a article about six weeks ago and that is the kamikaze candidate that was run with full knowledge of jason kenny in fact jason kenny being in the room it's witnessed now when they were talking about how jason kenny's team would give funding to the kamikaze candidate who was aimed at taking votes away from his primary rival brian jean both of those are still under investigation so now you have that groundwork and that really shows a lack of trust in the leader that obviously there, there were very, very um, non-transparent, dishonest actions under investigation that occurred in the last leadership race. Now you have a situation where, oh, you know, we're going to do this in person. It's going to be a paper ballot, manual ballot, counted there, ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. Well, I think that groups like TBA did their job far too well. <laughs> and they had told the Cambridge Hotel that they expected a max of 2,800 guests going through the day. Now, the vote was set up to run from 12 noon to 6 p.m. And you not only needed a UCP membership, that, and you need to hold it for 21 days prior to April 9th, you also needed to have an event ticket, which was $99. Well, there was an early bird special for $99.00 that expired on March 19th and after that it went to 149 then on the day of it went to 249 so by September or pardon me March 19th 
they had sold close to 59,000 memberships, or a total of 59,000 memberships, so sold about 45,000. And they had sold 15,000 special general meeting event tickets. Well, <clears throat> the interesting thing in all of this was as soon as you bought your SGM ticket, your phone lit up. And you're getting these calls from Team Kenny. Oh, do you, uh, you bought a ticket. Do you support Jason Kenny? He's done such a wonderful job. Have you are, you? are you voting for Jason Kenny? Do you support Jason Kenny? He's the best. And just on and on and on. You were just inundated with these. <clears throat> and it's our understanding from, because we do have a lot of people in the legislative office that contact us and, and give us information. And it was our understanding that the feedback very strongly was not in favor or support of Jason Kenny. So what happens? They pivot. Yep. And I feel that they used some very weak excuses for that pivot. They said, number one, there is no way they can accommodate 15,000 people to place a vote on April 9th. Well, the city of Red Deer has a lot more than 15,000 eligible voters who vote in every municipal, provincial, and federal election. Not only that, the party had received $1.5 million in revenue from just those ticket sales, let alone donations, they could have easily booked another couple of venues, held more. The whole city of Red Deer wanted them there because it was a huge financial boon to the city of Edmonton. Yeah. Heck, myself, my daughter, my son-in-law, we booked an Airbnb for three days. Yeah. We planned to be there for the day of setup, the day of, and the day of teardown afterwards. Um, that was like $800 alone, plus everything else. It would have been meals. It would have been food. Probably a beer or two. Yeah. No, um, and that's the great thing because it would have injected the yes. uh, stimulus into the economy during one of the worst shutdowns that we saw over the last two years. So to just the whole rip city it wanted up. it. And then I can imagine, and this this might be something you want to talk about here, but if the party just says, okay, we're going to go to a mail in ballot, I'm assuming those 15,000 people who have bought their hotels are going, I can't get a refund for that. Am I pooch? Do I have to go spend a weekend in Red Deer to absolutely do nothing to not vote for the democratically uh, process that we've put into place? Well, I, I think that most people were able to get a, uh, a refund. I, we were able to an Airbnb. dollars right? For the people who wanted to go yep. and actually vote and say, okay, I'm going to go, drive, yep. vote, then leave because that's my democratic right. I can do that. But now they can't. So, yeah. So, I mean, a, a few things really stuck out as being very dishonorable. Number one, you if you've ever been asked to play a game, I don't care if it's hockey, cricket, football, soccer, a board game, a card game, yep. you're at someone's house and they go, here, let's play this game, and they lay out the rules, you sit down and you start playing, and halfway through, they change the rules. It clearly tells you two things. You are winning, <laughs> and they are cheating. Yep. And that's what it said to everyone. Your original question was, how does this resonate when I go and talk to people all over the province? Every single person that I talk to feels that this is a dishonest, immoral, uh, morally bankrupt move by Team Kenny. Okay. Everyone thinks that he did this uh, because he knew he was losing. And when you're losing, what do you want to do? You want to change the game. You want to change the timeline. You need to wiggle and you need to squirm. It also gave him the opportunity to roll out a whole bunch of things to distract from this vote. So what did we get? In reflection, we got, oh, a reduction of provincial tax on gas. So our premier can now go say, oh, look at Alberta. That's pretty much the cheapest fuel in Canada. I'm a hero. It gave most homeowners $150 credit to home fuel heating costs. Oh, another hero move by our premier. He promised, I think, 15 new schools. He promised low-cost, almost free Wi-Fi to the rural. And I believe to the Red Deer area where this vote, vote was supposed to happen, he promised close to $2 billion in infrastructure to hospitals, roads, etc. All in the guise of saying, I am such a hero. I am saving our province. I am the best ever. But people, I think, are smart enough to realize he's using our own tax dollars to bribe his way through a vote process on the leadership review. I'm going to ask the semi question that's been lingering this whole time because you mentioned his name and I can imagine if there's a conservative who supports Jason Kennedy is yelling at their screen right now listening to this. It seems like you are talking the same talking points that Brian Jean is talking. 
do you have any connections with his campaign? Because he has been actively involved in trying to oust Jason Kenney because he believes that Jason Kenney will lose the next election and hand the party to Rachel Notley, hand the government to Rachel Notley. Um, in any connection or have you had any discussions with Brian Jean about your tour, about engaging with conservative leadership, uh, with conservative voters, with politically minded people across this province? Absolutely. I've talked to a dozen MLAs or more, uh, everybody from Grant Hunter to uh, Pete Guthrie, on and on and on the list goes Angela Pitt. <clears throat> and yes, I have definitely spoken with Brian Jean. In fact, when we go around the province, when we're in different areas, we reach out to the MLAs or the constituency associations and we go, we're having this meeting. If you want to come observe, that'd be great. And people might want to ask you questions because I know a certain amount about this, but I'm not an MLA. I'm not a CA president. They know things that I, I don't know and I may never know. So he has come out to a couple events actually. And um, I, we're are, you, are you working in connection with him? I this? wouldn't say we're working in connection with him at all. But you're working with <laughs> other MLAs as well. It's not like, because yet again, I'm just, I'm just trying to make sure that people get both sides, that you are not a subsection of Brian Jean's Absolutely campaign. not. There we are not endorsing anyone. And in yeah. fact, this was a real concern because... There's some interesting things about how you can announce you're running for the leadership of a party. Yeah. Uh, and some legislation has changed, Kenny's changed it, and you're not allowed to raise money, create a team, spend money, spend a dollar in advertising to run for a leadership uh, if you're an elected MLA until the executive team hands the nomination race papers into Elections Alberta. So technically, if there are other MLAs out there who would be interesting in running for party leadership, they can't announce anything. They could get disqualified. However, Brian Jean was able to bring it up in the media because he had run in his by-election. He won it. So he had a team. He had funding. He had the microphone. And when he had that microphone after he won, the media asked him, well, you know, all these things and what are your big things? And he goes, well, I don't like the leadership. We need Kenny out. And I think it is interesting. The one question <laughs> that he was specifically asked was, well, you really dislike, apparently you dislike Mr. Kenny's leadership. What would have you done different if you were leader because you were in that original leadership race? And the statement he made is, well, the first thing I would have done is I would have put Rachel Notley on my COVID cabinet. And so to most conservative <laughs> grassroots Albertans, that was just, Kenny's points went way up. Yeah. Because people are going, oh my goodness. If, because they see two options. They don't realize that other MLAs will announce and other people will announce once May 18th is over and Kenny loses. All they see is, oh, this is a two-horse race against Kenny and Brian Jean, and Brian Jean would like the NDP to run how we do COVID mandates, lockdowns, and restrictions. We're not interested. So, you know, how the politics go in this, like, um, it's just, it's really important for people to know that there's going to be a lot more people than Brian Jean running. We're not endorsing Brian Jean. We're not in Brian Jean's camp. We do have open dialogue with any MLA that wants to talk to us. We think it's important for people to get to know their representatives. We continually, almost every place we go, uh, we were in lots in Jason Nixon's writing, for instance, and everybody says, we email, we call, we call, we email, we email, we call, we call the constituents. And we can't get any answers. We want to change that. Yeah. We want to have people to be able to talk to, voice concerns, and be engaged with constituency associations and their MLAs. I want to talk about the 18th. So look, we're just sticking on this. We'll, 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 we'll tie it up into a nice little bow here for everyone here in a few minutes. But I want to stick with the leadership review here for a few seconds. May 18th comes. Leadership re announcement happens. Technically, it's supposed to. <laughs> Knock on what it's supposed Who to. Who knows? It's pivoted a few times. <laughs> exactly. Um, <clears throat> ballots are being mailed in right now as we speak. If you haven't, you should be mailing it in right now. Um, May 18th comes around. The announcement comes out that Jason Kenney is still the leader. He wins his support. Was this in vain? Was this message of crossing the province, of take back Alberta, of getting people involved in politics, getting people engaged in vain? Or do you accept the results first? Actually, I'll start with that one first. Do you accept the results if it comes down? Because we talked about the last leadership election where there was 6,000 6, votes where we don't really know who these people are. It could happen this time as well. Do you accept the results? 
Well, that's a very interesting question. And it's not so much whether I accept them or not. It's what the members accept. And the reason I say that, Jason Kenney has come out and said, well, 50% plus one vote is democracy, I stay in. <laughs> However, we realize that in this province already, the last three conservative leaders from Mr. Klein, Mr. Stelmack, and Alison Redford, all, now this wasn't a by members, but it was a caucus vote, all of them, I think, had like over 70%, and none of them stayed. Yeah. So this isn't a typical general populist vote. This isn't voting for homecoming queen. This is a vote for the party leader. And, and this near the province. That's right. And But this party is going into a pitched battle next spring, one year from now, for provincial election. So this has to be viewed differently. Because what it is really saying here is, Okay, we know that we're going to go up against an enemy. I hate to use that word, but it, an opponent. Let's say opponent instead of enemy. An opponent who is well-funded. They've been in that seat before. They had four years to learn the system, understand where they failed, where their strengths were, hone their skills. They have, from what I understand, close to $5 million in a reserve fund. The UCP, I think, has about a million. The NDP is far out-funded. they're nominating candidates right now. They they, are, they, and some really like qualified ones. They are the government waiting. So here, the, the UCP government is going in to the fight of their lives one year from now in the provincial election. And what this leadership review is really saying is, do you have faith in the general that will lead you into that battle? Now, if you go back through history, <clears throat> and if you were to pull an army that's going up against an equally well-funded, well-served, well-numbered enemy, and you poll the soldiers and you find out 49% of them don't want you, don't trust the general, and won't fight for the general, the odds of that army succeeding are pretty much zero. 100% chance of catastrophic failure. That's what this is all about. Whether you like Jason Kenney or not, the statistics, the facts prove that with Jason Kenney at the helm of the UCP party come the provincial election in May, the UCP will suffer a crushing defeat. It all polls, all indicators show that the NDP will form a majority government. And if you're an NDP fan, uh, person, that's great. This is a democracy. Vote for who you want. I'm not saying not to vote. Yeah. I'm just saying what has happened within the UCP party through poor leadership, disingenuous leadership, leadership that's not collaborative, they've lost the grassroots. They've lost the voters. Up to 60 to 80 percent of traditional conservatives have said they won't vote for Kenny. It's not that they're going to go vote for the NDP or the Green Party, the Liberals. They're just not going to vote, period. So I think a few things will happen. If uh, I think that Jason Kenney is going to win between 46 and 53% of the vote. Really? Um, I, that's just mine, and I've been wrong before. <laughs> so don't place money on that. <laughs> I'm going to right now. You've heard I, it first. <laughs> we'll do a little side bet. And uh, <clears throat> I think that if he... Re, if he gets that 50% plus one vote to 60%, in fact, even 65%, I believe that the party will implode. And the reason I say this, there's all, it's already divisive. There's already countless, well, not countless, numerous MLAs who come out on a regular basis with statements. We see that Rick McIver, who's part of that tight, tight inner circle of Jason Kenney, his CA president just quit. Couldn't handle anymore. Couldn't take it anymore. I talked to all these MLAs, and they all fear for their job. It's a it's a bullying style government within their own caucus. There is no engagement. There is no collaborativeness when you're on a committee. Uh, the premier walks in and goes, "This is how it's going to go," and this is what we do. I mean, he's made statements. It doesn't matter what these advisory MLA committees come up with. At the end of the day, I'm party leader, and I have the pen and I sign. So. What I think will happen, I mean, you can go back to Stelmack and Redford. Stelmack got 77%, and with, in 14 months, I think it was, he was gone. Yep. Um, Redford got 78%. I think within 12 months, she was gone. If Mr. Kenny thinks that he's going to cling to the leadership of this party, getting less than 75%, it didn't work, 77 and 78 didn't work for Redford or Stelmack. I don't think he, he under, I don't see how he thinks he can cling to power at less than 75%. So it's not really what I believe, it's what the people believe, and it's what the people feel. And you know, to go back to the numbers, 
there's about 59,000 memberships sold. 37,000 approximately are rural. And it's a well-stated fact that 80% of rural is not in favor of Kenny. About 7,700 memberships in Edmonton, 16,000 in Calgary. And, you know, those could go probably more in his favor. But unless the ballots don't make it through the mail system, hey, I'm not accusing, I'm not <laughs> stating fraud I know fraud Ken the post, some of them won't. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, it's only if people didn't get on it and get their vote mailed in, their yeah. ballot mailed in right away, that some may linger in the mail. They go to Ottawa, don't they? The ballots go to Ottawa to be counted? Nope, nope. They go to Deloitte's office in Edmonton. Uh, okay, I think that was... So that's good. Was, Okay. No, they go to Deloitte's office in Edmonton to be counted. And I believe that the scrutineering system, the CA presidents can all be scrutineers. It's all under camera. It's actually, I believe, in a locked vault room that was designed for uh, Alberta Gaming uh, Commission and Gaming, okay. ALGC or whatever, for lottery funding and lottery tickets and all that. So I believe that Deloitte has a, a very top shelf uh, thing. And you know, people go, oh, Deloitte will cheat in this. And I go, it would be insanity, in my opinion, for Deloitte to cheat. They're an international company, and to cheat and create fraud for one premier in one little province of four and a half million people, and if it was ever discovered, it would destroy the credibility of that name globally, it makes no sense. So I'm not worried about that process. The only thing that concerned me, the ballots were originally mailed out by the UCP party, and I have had hundreds and hundreds of calls of people who are still waiting for their ballot, and when they call the 1-800 number or the email info at unitedconservative.ca nothing happens and nothing happens and nothing happens and nothing happens I also have lots and lots of people who their ballot comes it's got the wrong name it's got the wrong address doesn't match I also have lots who've gotten two ballots and so, heard that. <clears throat> so now they're like what do I do do I mail in both do I mail in the first one do I mail in the last one what's going to get I go well I would just mail in the first one I don't know I don't have the answer I wouldn't mail in both because to me that's like, and we know for a fact there was between 42 and 4,800 memberships bought in the last day or two before March 19th cutoff on five credit cards. Well, that seems a little suspect. Well, it's allowed to because they changed the rules on who could buy memberships. Right? Didn't really come into effect till April 1st, though. Oh. If you went on uh, and bought your membership like I did on February 7th, it clearly stated in there that you could only buy for yourself or direct family members. Well, I don't know five people in this province who have 900 direct family members. No. Uh, no. The odds are slim. The odds are slim. They, maybe the squirrels? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are squirrels and rabbits in this city. So, I mean, there are some things that are suspect, definitely. But I think that all in all, um, once you get your ballot in the mail, fill it out, get it back in, I think that that part of the process is very secure we have one last set of questions i want to talk about and that is post 18th does the tour continue so yeah what we're doing right now we have an rv yep it's wrapped it's got uh i want to sign it oh i didn't <laughs> bring it with me tonight okay, i was gonna say you better have brought this <laughs> i will come by with it and you can sign it before we're done yes. so what we want to do after the 18th to me i say the 19th is a whole new world Mm -hmm. What our goal was after, like it would have been April 10th, was to continue <clears throat> engagement because now the whole process is who's running for the new leader if Kenny is not the leader, if he has to step down. So there will be a whole leadership race. There will be a nomination process in there. Uh, we wanted to be able to have whoever wants out of those nominees to come meet with us. We'll ask them the questions that are important to TBA members. We'll do a thing like yours. Heck, we could even do it here too and do a podcast, get them out to all TBA members so that they can answer our questions, answer what's important to us. And uh, then we can see who's there because <clears throat> the whole thing about TBA that excites me is number one, there isn't enough civic engagement in Canada. This helps to spur that. Number two, we get the chance with this leadership review to hold a leader accountable. Yep. Us, the people. It's never happened in the history of the Canadian Constitution where members have voted out an elected premier midterm. It's happened in caucus, but never by members. But then the third thing is, it gets us the ability to be involved going forward, to help to pick the new leader, give them our mandates, but support them. This is what happens 
we live our lives, we vote once every four years, municipally, provincial, or federally, and we go back to our lives, and then we wonder why we have a mess. It's because we don't get involved, we don't support them, we don't have, hold them accountable. If we want big changes in this province, whether it's this, the educational system, whether it's health care, whether it's policing, whether it's collection of CPP or our own taxes, if it's any of these things, the only way a premier can do that is if they have a group like TBA that has a few hundred thousand members that say do it. I mean, I always say this analogy right here. You could, through your mind, memory, and history, pick out your favorite political leader. I don't care if it's Julius Caesar, Winston Churchill, JFK, Ronald Reagan, whoever. Yep. Whoever. You could reincarnate them, resurrect them, you'd put them as Premier of Canada, or I mean of Alberta, and they couldn't touch AHS. Because AHS has about 210,000 direct and indirect employees. And no premier with card carrying of less than 1% can attack that voter base. But now, you know, we get through the selection in May of 2023. <clears throat> we get to next fall, a year and a half from now. There's 300,000 TBA members. We can say to that premier, let's tack th tackle the bigger issues. And, you know, I don't want to stigmatize AHS. I know lots and lots of amazing people in those organizations, but they're caught in a system where they can't speak up, and if they voice their opinion, they're in trouble, their careers are threatened, and their livelihoods threatened, and they're really painted into a corner. So we need to give them the ability to actually exercise true democracy. And it will never occur unless we, the people, get united, step up, hold their leaders accountable, but support them for the things that are important to us, to our province, to our community, and to our families. One last question that's kind of an important one after your last few statements there, Zane. Could we potentially, if Jason Kenney loses the leadership review, see a Novak leadership candidacy? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I get asked that a lot. No, you know, I ran for mayor and it was an eye-opening uh, experience. <laughs> <clears throat> I, it was funny. I sell little hand lotions. We create them. My daughter, my son-in-law, we create them. They're all organic, all natural, no chemical preservatives. And I put them in some little uh, shops around the province. And there's a lovely lady farmhouse market in uh, Sundry. Aww. And my son-in-law, he helps me with the paperwork. Dylan's amazing. And so we're there, and I'm, and I'm giving her the lotions. I'm talking about Take Alberta because she's very much on side. <clears throat> and she asked me the same question. She goes, Zane, are you going to put your name forward to run for premier? And Dylan lifts his head up from the paperwork, and Dylan goes, hell no. Pardon the language, people. Oh, God. <laughs> We've said words. We've had words on the show. And, no, absolutely not. My name is not going to be in the ballot at all. Not a chance. Um, I like what I'm doing right now. I think that I can... In a true, honest, nonpartisan fashion, even though this happens to be a conservative movement, I think these movements are important, whether you have an NDP government, a liberal government, a Green Party, or whatever. It's important for people to get engaged at the grassroots level. And I love this. I love being able to see people hear about democracy, uh, how they can be involved in it, how they can get involved in their CA organizations, how they can be a voice for their community and their families. I love this role I'm in right now. I'm not running for office. Um, as I said, and you, we've been on the show before during the municipal election. You know what I used to say all the time, and that is, if you don't get engaged, if you don't go out, get educated on what's happening in your province, in your city, in your country, then do not complain on social media for the next four years. Yes. You have the opportunity right now to make bigger changes by taking out a membership in a party than you do in an actual election. I know that sounds weird, and I, I will explain it for this reason to my listeners. You, you, in, a, in a general election, you are voting for an MLA. In a party membership, you're voting for the leader. And the, the person with the most seats gets to be premier. The person with the most votes as the leadership candidate gets to be the leader of the party who then goes on to be premier. So if there is a leadership review, a race, get a membership because that person will be the next premier of our province. And you will get to have that choice right here, right now. If you don't and you are upset with the final result, don't come complain, complain to me because at the end of the day, you had your opportunity. It's on you. I always say this. We talk lots about who's controlling the world right now. Yeah. There's a lot of globalism. There's a lot of thoughts along that line. You know who controls the world? Those who show up. Show up. Get your membership. Get involved. Know your MLAs. You'll get to know possibly even the premier. 
Use your voice. Strength in numbers. Use your voice. And to the MLAs who are listening to this right now, stop being the fly in the fly in during the election and then leave. Be engaged during your actual term. It's a weird concept for some, but actually be engaged. That's the worst thing about this municipal politics right now. I do not see engagement in the Northeast, and I'm pissed off about that. So get engaged, get involved, and actually, for the, the politicians, federally, municipal, provincial, school board, go knock some doors. <laughs> be our representatives. We elected you to be our representatives, exactly. not our overlords. Get, let's get back in our lanes, and let's do our job right. Zane, it is always a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm so happy that we were able to sit down and do this, so thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me, and I'm really happy my schedule worked out today because it's been a little hectic, but <laughs> I'm glad I'm here. This uh, has been great, as always. I'm glad you are, too. Um, for everyone here at the Crossword Interviews with Chris Brown, I just want to remind everyone that May is Brain Tumor Awareness Month. Um, every donation to the show for the month of May, as you see, I'm wearing a big blue shirt. It's not just because of the conservative guy in the room. It's just it's the uh, Brain Tumor Foundation Canada's Hope for a Walk. Uh, which is happening on June 11th. Any donation that comes into the show during the month of May is going to that walk, is going to the Brain Tumor Foundation. As you know, I've been struggling with a brain tumor over the last two years. So if you can donate to a cause, to someone who's walking, learn a little bit more. We'll be talking about it more in depth. That's what the commercial was for this one. Um, so with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, get involved, get engaged, and for Fudge's sakes, get off social media and go vote. <laughs> exactly. And if you want to know more about TBA, we're on Facebook. That's right. Take, Sorry. Take, out, take Back Alberta 2022 is on Facebook, we're on Instagram. And we have uh, just a sign in page for our website, but we'll be launching a full website here in the next few days. Awesome. So that's in the show notes below. So scroll down, check the. You know what? You know how to do it. Just don't do it while you're driving, please, because I've seen a few accidents in the last few days and the people were texting. So. Stop it. So, Zane, thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Talk to you guys later. Bye.